The Chocolate Kitchen has proved really popular with visitors. It's a story about chocolate which appeals to everybody, but also it's a royal story. It's the only royal chocolate kitchen that you'll see anywhere in Britain. And it's a brand new discovery. We found it in the last year. The chocolate kitchens have been talked about for years at Hampton Court, for centuries really, because tantalisingly we thought there was a chocolate kitchen. There was some research done in the 70s that failed to establish where it was, and two years ago we started really seriously looking for it. Charlotte was spending a lot of time in the archives looking for references to the chocolate kitchen, and then suddenly made this major discovery of this inventory document. I'd call it archival gold. It detailed every room in the palace. Not only did it show about the chocolate kitchen, it showed exactly where it was. And so suddenly we had our kitchen. And then when we went in there, it was stacked floor to ceiling with racking, filled with vases. And when we took it all down, what was there was this perfectly preserved early 18th century kitchen. The thing about chocolate is that it was absolutely the luxury item for George and England. If you could afford chocolate, you were something special. Chocolate is the most luxurious drink that you can buy. You have to think of it as the most expensive champagne. If you're the King of England, then everything for you has to be the best of the best. And so if chocolate is the fashionable drink, then you have your own chocolate maker who travels from palace to palace with you, given his own special chocolate kitchen. When we removed all the shelves from inside the chocolate kitchen, we found a lot of evidence of the fact that it had been used as a kitchen beforehand, the fireplace with the grate. We also have a lot of shelves on the walls which originate from the Georgian period and a very special piece of equipment, charcoal embrasures in the corner. I would think you would call them stoves, Georgian stoves. And it's fantastic that we find something so well preserved, clearly something that hasn't been touched in hundreds of years. When people talk about a chocolate kitchen and having your own chocolate chef, everyone thinks they're making a large bar of chocolate for His Majesty. Chocolate in Georgian times is just an ingredient. It goes into other things. 90% of the time, it goes into a drink, and that's what the king had here each day. Every single king had his own personal chocolate maker. George the first, his chocolate maker is Thomas Tozier. We think that Thomas Tozier was plucked out of his chocolate shop in Greenwich to work in the palaces, but meanwhile his wife, Grace, was running their business. She was an exceptionally glamorous and I think driven woman. She really used the position of her husband as chocolate maker to the king to brand the business. When we hear about her chocolate house, we know that it was almost a celebrity haunt. Contemporary newspapers list the glamorous people who went there. The chocolate arrives from South America as raw beans. Those beans have to be roasted, and then the center, like a little nut inside called a nib, is then ground. That's the secret to good chocolate. If you just eat a nib, it's a bit sandy, a bit gritty. The more you grind and grind and grind on the hot stone, the better it will taste. Once you've done this, you can pour that raw chocolate off into a little disc, like a huge chocolate button called a cake. And that is your ingredient. That gets put to one side. In some accounts, saying a month is good to let the flavours meld together. Chocolate comes over from South America via the Spanish. And what happens is they bring all the equipment over with them. So you're going to need a hot stone called a matate so that your staff can grind the chocolate beans on there. You're also going to need whisks, because part of chocolate is to have a froth on top. So you have to have specialist pots and little whisks that fit inside called molinettes, so you can get that lovely cappuccino top. We've done a lot of research to conserve and represent the chocolate kitchen, right down to analysing the paint under microscopes for its chemical composition, and we've been able to recreate the exact paint scheme that would have been in there when Mr Tozier was cooking here in the early 18th century. What we've chosen to do in the chocolate room is to recreate what we think was there. When we were recreating the items to fill the chocolate room, we tried to be as accurate as possible. Every object that you see in there has a story. And to do that, we went to some of the best craftsmen all across England who are skilled in the old techniques, so they could make us things that didn't just look like Georgian objects, they were actually made the same way and function in the same way. So for example, for all the pewter items, we actually made sure that we are copying things not by any goldsmiths, but by royal goldsmiths. For Hampton Court Palace, we used all the original lead bronze moulds. We do have the largest stock of antique moulds in the world, some of them dating back to 1723. And the mixture of the metal that goes in there is 98% tin, 1% copper, 1% antimony. 
So this is cast at around 430 degrees centigrade. It cools off quite quickly, being pewter. And then the mould is knocked apart and then it pops into the turning shop to go on a lathe and to be hand turned. It's turned, designs are put into that and then it's burnished off. And they're very simple tools. Go back to Roman times and nothing's really changed since then. Chocolate was considered glamorous and naughty and decadent. It would have been poured out from a silver chocolate pot or even a gold one. We know that William III had a 33 ounce gold chocolate pot. The chocolate pot that was made by the pewterers is a copy of a pot by Benjamin Pine dating to about 1709. The pewterers were very patient because we were being really fussy about getting things like the hinges right. So I was so pleased that the craftsmen were actually probably more fussy than I was and really got the details right. Really what the documentary evidence tells us is that everything that was used to serve chocolate was incredibly luxurious. So they didn't just have any old chocolate cup, they had a porcelain chocolate cup. They didn't just have a chocolate cup even, they had a special silver cup holder for it, it's called chocolate frames. What we did with the chocolate frame, we made a model from scratch. We made all the flutes and everything for that and put scallops around the edge. With the rim for the top of the chocolate frame, that was turned out the top of a goblet and we put a little beaded edge on. And believe it or not, the little feet for the chocolate frame, that was made out of the top of a spoon which we pierced out. And those periods, pewter smiths would have only had maybe 40 moulds to the name then. So we'd have made many, many things out of those 40 moulds. So we were making it exactly as people did two, three hundred years ago, just adapting other things. It's very intricate work soldering. You have to be very careful because at that stage, all the pieces are polished up bright, ready to go. It's absolutely critical that everything is right because if you melt something at that stage, you've lost everything. Chocolate was a breakfast drink, so as well as chocolate being served, they would have had suitable nibbles. Sweetmeats were served on elegant stands called sweetmeat glasses, and that's why we were so keen to have the glassmakers make them. Well, we make our glasses historically accurate as we possibly can, studying them, looking at photographs, taking drawings, measurements, and uh, trying to reproduce that in the time on the tradition of glassmaking. Well, the main furnace is on 24 hours a day, seven days a week. For melting or preparing the glass, we might be as high as 13, 50 centigrade. To make a glass vessel, the first thing I have to do is to gather glass from the furnace onto a blowing iron. I can then shape that glass, prepare it for blowing by shaping it, centering it, cooling it down, and then it can be blown. In order to start a bubble off in a gather of glass, I'll use a process called thumbing out. And essentially what I'm doing is I'm trapping air under high pressure in the blowing iron uh, by sticking my thumb over the top end of the blowing iron. And the air under high pressure is heated up by the hot glass, expands it even more, and starts to blow the bubble. I can then continue to blow the bubble by blowing down the tube. The hotter the glass, the easier it is to blow. It's a bit like blowing up a new balloon. The first bit is really tricky, but once you got over that bit, then it's easier. With the process of uh, reheating, blowing, careful tooling with the, with the glass blower's tools, one starts to shape the bowl of the glass. So it's a constant process of making sure that you're counteracting gravity all the time. If I stop turning, the glass will just droop and fall to the floor. Once I've taken the glass uh, out of the glory hole, uh, I'll have, say, 30 to 40 seconds to work on the, on the glass before it cools down too much and stiffens up too much and, and needs another reheat. Glass blowing is a very traditional craft. It goes right back to the early Roman period, right back to the time of the first emperors. It's just practice, really. We are so lucky that we have a wonderful archaeological collection through looking at the fragments, we are able to find shards of actual chocolate cups. By using these fragments, we're able to not only recreate an appropriate chocolate cup, we're actually able to recreate the very chocolate cups that the kings and queens in these palaces would have drunk out of. 
The stuff for the chocolate kitchen, well I did a lot of work on that to get it super accurate to the Georgian period. I look very carefully at the things and spend a lot of time looking at drawings and at photographs or going and looking at the pieces just so you can get it right. So you put the, the clay on the wheel, you press onto it really hard and push it right into the centre and open the clay up and then the next thing is called knuckling up and the finger inside pushing against your knuckle on the outside and, and you, the clay then just lifts up. After about 20 years of practice, it, 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 sometimes it happens. After you've made the cylinder, most of the hard work's done and then you push it onto the throwing rib and you can form whatever shape you want. Pots of earlier periods are, are roughly finished, but they're not clumsy. They're really fine pieces of work. You have nothing but admiration for them. These people were geniuses and it's sheer exuberance and, and love. It's very difficult to get into the mindset of, uh, in this case, the 18th century people. You have to sort of forget what, you've, what, what the last two or three hundred years have, have taught you and, uh, and sort of go back to what they were thinking. I think what makes this a great visitor experience is the authenticity. You're standing in the chocolate kitchen in this perfectly preserved space, so everything is very resonant and real. I went to see Hampton Court Palace and it made me proud, not just of me, but all of the workforce that we have here. When I saw it in that chocolate kitchen, I was, <laughs> I felt really proud. It did look right. It's the feeling that you're walking in the footsteps of real people who lived and worked in the palace. And in this case, it's Mr. Tozier. If he walked in here tomorrow, he would recognise what he's looking at.